How's everybody doing today? All right, cool. Um, so I was going to ask everyone to introduce themselves, but we've already done that part. So we're going to just jump right in. Um, before we actually get, get to the actual questions, um, the final piece of my introduction was, what is your superpower? What's the thing that you're, you're known for and, and people, people remember you by? Cynthia, you want to kick us off? I would say that my friends would say that I really am good at finding shortcuts. But that, <laughs> to provide some context, and I look at it as problem solving. I walk with a cane. I don't know if you notice when I walk up. So I always avoid barriers. So like I'm just so used to navigating my physical environment. Yeah. So that kind of just transitions to life and just overcoming barriers or obstacles. I love it. Uh, for me, I would say that I am, I, some people call it crunk, enthusiastic. <laughs> when I believe in something, you get it all. Um, so that's either good, a superpower or not, but I can definitely get other people excited and motivated um, to do their thing. Cool. Uh, for me, I think um, I'm really a connector. However, I will say it's everything from you need a DJ, you need a bartender, what? or do you need oh, wait, someone, you do you DJ need a strategist? <laughs> Are you I, could, the, I oh. could put a good playlist together and I could shake a good drink. I'll just say that. <laughs> I love it. Um, uh, my friends say that I have soft eyes um, when we travel. So that the, the people always come up to me and want to sell me whatever they have on the beach or whatever they've got. <laughs> he said, you, your, your eyes are a little too soft to be out here with me right now. So I find myself being kind of a connector as well. I think I do pretty well. At, um, I love connecting with people uh, and kind of figuring out where, where we could be together. So. Um, I, I have, in my personal life, I would say um, I, I make the best gumbo and greens that of anybody I know. Wow. Wow. I'll just throw that down. In my, uh, in my business life, I would say that um, I have pretty good, I have good judgment. Cool. I guess I should answer that too. Uh, let's see, what is my superpower? I would say that I am a community builder. I am very much like them, a uh, connector of folks, particularly being in the Bay, coming from D.C., where there were a lot of black people, and they're not, that ma not as many <laughs> as I'm used to. I had to figure out a way to create space for myself and folks like, like me, and so I used that as my platform, and that ultimately started and spearheaded how I ended up at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So I would say I'm a community builder. Yeah, so we're going to just actually jump in this time. Um, so our, our panel today is focused on cultivating a diverse pipeline. Um, in, in technology where I work, a lot of the conversations are about the pipeline, are, like, are about diversity and inclusion. Um, and oftentimes we focus on the diversity part and not necessarily the inclusion. Our goal here is to, to have a more holistic conversation about how we approach creating diverse pipelines, but more importantly, once you've created said pipeline, how do you keep folks in, in companies? How do you build a culture of inclusion? And how do you create spaces that allow for folks who may not have you know, a history of being in these particular companies be able to thrive and, and be successful in the space? Um, so our panelists are full of experts who are doing a lot of work in, in those spaces, and you'll hear very different perspectives. And so the first question is, um, what is one diversity recruiting initiative or strategy um, that you've seen in your workplace or other workplaces um, that, that have worked or have been effective? And we can have, you, know, you can answer it as you, as you feel. So at Visa, one of the things we realized is that the community of people that we have, really um, utilizing them to help with that recruiting piece. However, we know that some things get in the way sometimes, right? So um, we piloted a program where we essentially created a process to skip the line on the referral process, right? So, and that means I'm calling on all of you to come to this room at this time and on paper or online, bring me your top five to 10 candidates for these roles. And guess what? You're going to sit right next to a recruiter and it's in an immediate decision. Okay? Follow up next time, whatever it is, right? Because what happens is 
we're not, as I said, my superpower is connecting, right? I don't think we're connecting with the folks that we already have enough yep. to, to connect us with the people that they know. So that's one thing that's, that's critical around recruiting. And then I know we're gonna talk a little bit about retention, but I think that's the start of retaining people, is when you get them in the door based on someone they know, that automatically creates that community so that you know who you can call on when you come to Visa and that they can help you navigate, right? So that's one and, thing we do. And has that been effective so far? So we piloted it and we made it official now. We're gonna roll it out. Um, and you know, companies have employee resource groups. You use your people and all of that. So I can tell you that it will be effective because our people want to do it, right? They wanna do it. Um, so I work at the Q4 Center, um, which focuses on diversifying the tech industry. And it's really interesting in terms of my very first day there, first time that I met folks who work there, I looked around and everybody looked like me. Everybody was either African American, uh, Latinx, um, uh, people who you would think are traditionally underrepresented in tech are definitely represented in the Q4 Center. Uh -huh. So I, I would say, and it's just a, a really wonderful place to work, it's a great place to be, and people want to work there. So I would have to say creating an environment that is inclusive, um, where people want to be, goes a long way in terms of attracting diverse talent. Completely um, build on, to build off that, I, I definitely think that when you have the right work environment and people feel like they're gr growing, that they're treated fairly and that they're earning um, like uh, attracts like. And I think that that is a really important part of um, building the right culture and being able to have programming. Um, one program that we are really excited that we um, launched two years ago and we've seen a 25% um, higher rate is a program that we call Box Business Fellows. And we basically bring a group of students who are in their junior year and senior year um, and historically black colleges and universities to come to um, our space, and again, in the spirit of like attracts like, we know that we're a great place to work, we know that we have fun together, we know that our CEO is cool, but we wanna make sure that they get to experience that in a, in a way where they really get to see the culture for themselves and really think about careers in tech, and not everyone in tech has to be an engineer or a product manager, and so we really introduce them to a variety of different types of roles that could be interesting fits for them. Um, we give them case studies so they get to learn a little bit more about our customers and what makes us proud, and they get a chance to try that on during the week in addition to getting to know each other better. And by the end of the week, we get to know them, and so when roles open up, it's an easier placement for us when we get those juniors and seniors into some of our key positions, um, whether they be you know, based in Austin or based here in uh, Redwood City. So we're excited we've done that now for two years. We're getting ready to do our third, and like I said, we've had a 25% success rate. So I, I get a chance from where I where I sit to work with a lot of folks in C-suites and um, senior management. Uh, and, and also I get to see best practices across industries in a lot of different spaces. And one of the things that, that has been, um, that I saw that was new to me was um, there, there, there's been a trend, especially with a company like Salesforce around like equity, pay equity amongst gender. And I've seen a couple companies that I can't mention yet because they're still in the middle of it, but they are starting to do that by ethnicity as well. And what I've seen is that people who understand that you're really trying to create a fair, just workplace, that attracts people. So sometimes people of leadership, especially senior leaders, are oftentimes afraid to put themselves out there in that way because of the politics that it, that it requires. But we've seen um, through some of the companies that are on our best, best workplaces list, they're trying to push that envelope a little bit further and they've seen the, the return on people understanding that we're really trying to create an inclusive workplace. So they've seen the recruitment and the retention sort of um, uh, numbers increase and they're seeing their profitability and gross overall margins like increase as well. So they're pushing the, the, the limit around equity um, and, and making sure that that salary discrepancy does not exist amongst ethnicities as well. So a, a couple of years ago, um, we sort of did a thought experiment, um, which is how is it, why is it that we are, we compete so hard to, to attract 
um, persons of color. And my firm has offices on the East Coast and West Coast. And in the West Coast, it was less of an issue. Um, and, and part of that thought process was, well, it's a given that if you're going to a law firm like mine, or 90% of the law firms in this country, um, you're going into a, a white environment. That's a given. That's, that's baked into the cake. So what is it? And what we began to realize is um, part of it is that law students are uninformed consumers. They cannot distinguish between one law firm and another. And the thought then was, what is the primary thing that they're really looking for? And I think beyond pay, beyond anything else, when you're first making that decision, it's, can I be safe here? Will I be safe? And it's as fundamental as that. And safe means will I be just not merely successful, but do I have to fight for it? How do I have to, but will I be safe? And so what we began to do is go to law schools outside of the hiring process and present panels that were just, how, are you, how can you be successful in the law? And it wasn't pitched towards our a firm. It wasn't pitched towards you should come. It's not a, a hiring pitch. It's rather, how can you be successful? And we found that by offering that, they got to know us in, in a way that's more intimate. Not merely the persons of color at our firm, but also the white folks at our firm who they'll also be interacting with. And that has paid off for us because I think that's when you start to answer the question and you differentiate yourself from just a mass of law firms that is very difficult when you're not already inside to figure out what is the difference and what is, what is meaningful to me in terms of my life. For sure, that, that totally makes sense. I think psychological and physical safety are a big part of being able to create spaces that promote and create inclusion, so that makes total sense. Um, so as we're thinking about like the pipeline and building this pipeline, um, what are the roles of external partnerships or organizations who are helping to like build this pipeline? And do you have any examples of, of organizations or partnerships that you've explored that have actually been effective? Well, I think it's clear we're here, yeah. right? Um, I think, and I have to shout out Adamica here because she connected us with CBE and there's plenty, right? There's plenty of organizations that you can partner with, but I'm a big fan of creating your own. Yeah. Um, and I say that because at Visa, there are nuances there, very similar to what you're saying. And, you know, kind of creating the space for the folks that we want to come into Visa, to have the dialogue, to do a knowledge share, whether it's about our you know, our connected car or wearables or whatever in the payment industry, right? And then you then create this environment where you're not only sharing knowledge, but you're showing them who you are, to your point. You bring them in your own house, right? And you connect them with the people there that can identify the other folks that may not be identified by an affinity, but are making the decisions. Right, so I think you have to balance that because I don't know what everyone else is experiencing, but we are bombarded with opportunities to engage with external organizations and it's sometimes hard to tell. So I think it's a both and partnerships, you decide what levels and then you create your own. I really look at it like it's, I feel like a, a part of an underground railroad. That's kind of how I think about it. You know, I'm, I'm looking at it like the, we were talking just very briefly that if I just follow what the HBR um, articles tell you to do, and if I kind of look at what they tell you to do on Fast Company, that's kind of the surface level thing to do, and, you, and that works to a certain extent, but I always find that I have to travel a couple degrees below that and really tap into who it is that I know and trust that they'll be able to tap into who 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 they know to really be able to pull in the people that we want. So I, I really look at it like we're a part of a different sort of 21st century underground railroad um, as we pull people into the organization and keep people here. That's that's kind of what resonates with me. I would say there's something about um, and, and everything that you all were saying really resonates around 
just being authentic about it. Um, I think that there are a lot of partnerships that are out there that as they get bigger, it becomes pay to play and you're kind of one of many. There's so many organizations. And when I think about Box, it's like we're a 2,000 person global organization at the same event with like a Facebook and a Google where you just feel like, burp, 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 here we are over here in the corner. <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 so it makes you really think about what would allow you to present yourself in the most authentic way so that people will decide either this is for me, not for me. And so we really explore partnerships where we get to know that organization very deeply and we can do fun things together. Um, and so we've had some great partnerships with a couple of organizations where they come on, so they're coming tomorrow, so we're gonna have Arlen Hamilton come and talk for our Black Futures Month tomorrow, and so we're bringing the same organization back. We've hosted things for them, but where we really get to lavish time and get to know each other because that's the community that whether there's a role for them at Box or not, they're helping to create those relationships even for us so that when we have roles that open, they know people who know people. And so I think the more intimate you can build relationship and build really a sense of community and hack at problems together, the more you feel like either the, the dollar investment, the people investment, the roles that you have, you're able to kind of draw from that well. And so you have to transition out of that recruiting mind where if I don't get three hires then it wasn't worth that money. But if you're really investing in that community and in that relationship, it's gonna pay itself for it, so it's like planting those seeds. Yeah. yeah, everything that you just said, I completely and totally agree with. Um, you know, when you think about partnerships, I think it's really important to, first of all, start with the whole relationship piece, and really what's in it for both parties. Oftentimes, one party will approach another party thinking that they know what the other party needs, and kind of define things. And I think that oftentimes you just need to sit down and say, hey, I'm really interested in what you're doing. What are your needs? Here are my needs. And is there opportunity to, uh, to collaborate? It's interesting in that I was, I, I just held a webinar the day before yesterday um, about recruiting at HBCUs and partnerships, building partnerships at HBCUs. And one of the things that the moderator, that the, one of my guests said, was that oftentimes people will just come to me and say, where are your best students? And all folks wanna do is take, 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 and not understand what the needs of the institution and particularly of the professors are. I think the same thing applies when you think about talent development and pipeline recruitment programs. You think, okay, we gotta get our numbers up, so what we, can we do? We can partner with, you know, let's just say HBCUs, but oftentimes the faculty members are not involved, the key stakeholders are not involved, and and people are making decisions that are at the high, high, high level and they don't engage the people who are actually doing the work. So I think it's really important that when we think about partnerships, A, we think about relationships, but B, we think about really engaging folks from a holistic perspective so you're not just focused on you know, the people who may look at this as a photo op and kind of go on and, and leave everything else to chance. I, I think I think there are a couple um, levels at which um, we enter into it, and and I think I've I've become distinctly aware, having talked to all these panel members, that um, a law firm feels like a different creature than a little bit of this. So, because we're a service organization, some of our closest um, allies and partners are, are in this are our clients, um, and. That's, that is both a carrot and a stick. It's a stick, it, it's, it, it's a stick to the extent that um, a lot of our clients are very insistent that we are diverse in the persons we put on their cases and that we're a diverse law firm. And um, it can be a stick in the sense that you are given that warning if not. And clients have turned away some of our pitches when It'll come into a certain partner and they will put together a, a group of lawyers who are either all males or all white folks. Um, and they'll say, that's just not what we want. Um, it's a carrot to the extent that um, we are well aware of that and very conscious of that. So it, it, it creates that relationship with, with the, your, your clients. Um, there are things that we are doing now, for example, with Facebook, where we are hiring a summer associate and splitting them between Facebook and us. Um, and 
eBay has done this, HP has done this. Um, and I think on a go forward, I think it would be nice to work more collaboratively in that respect with our, with our clients and with other affiliates, it doesn't just have to be clients, but to affirmatively decide that this is an area that we can work on together. Um, I think we've done that before, but I think there's a lot more we could do. For sure. Um, so my next, my next question is around the Rooney Rule. Um, can someone tell me what the Rooney Rule is and how do we see it play out in some of the recruiting or pipeline building that's happening at your companies? I had to look it up, so I'm going to let somebody else <laughs> <laughs> explain it. It's I had on. to Google yeah. that first. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I'm from Pittsburgh, and I love me some art, Rooney, so. Um, <coughs> Diehard Steelers fan. Um, Rooney Rule, really very grateful for that pioneering thought, and you talk about systems um, that can make change. The Rooney Rule would be opening up the pipeline so that during an interview process that you're at least able to present a diverse slate um, that would have two or more um, individuals that represent um, a diverse slate so that as you're making a consideration that you're obviously filling the slate with great qualified applicants that also expose you to broader diverse groups. Um, what I would say what makes it work, um, you have to have a system that enables it or it's just a, a waste of time. Um, uh, so I would say at our company, we definitely are focused on the Rooney Rule, particularly for our executive level positions. Um, but what would make it work even more effectively regardless is making sure that the recruiting timeline gives you the time and the space um, to ensure that you're able to go after that diverse slate. So oftentimes, when you're doing that recruiting process, they needed that person three weeks ago, and you're starting that process. So you need to make sure that there is an understanding between the management team and the recruiting team that you're going to take your time so that you can put that slate together. So that's one and systematic thing that has to be a part of it. The second is what we talked about around cultivating relationships. So if you want to be able to pull together a diverse group, you have to have those connections. And I really love that idea of front of the line, but just thinking about like what are the pipeline opportunities that you have to make sure that when roles open, that you have a network um, so that you can draw upon it, so that you can try to get it done in a timely manner. And then I think the third is making sure that you have um, hiring processes and hiring managers who are aware of their blind spots as it relates to bias, um, because it doesn't matter who you bring in, if they are struggling with some of those bias and those and biases and they bring that into the conversation, they will find lots of reasons to confirm why that particular talent isn't a good fit. So um, my only advice and something that we're really pushing our teams to think about is how do you enable the system or cultivate the system that would allow a Rooney rule to, to take heart so that you're able to bring in great talent. So uh, I'll say North Catholic in the house. Hey, okay. <laughs> uh, I lived in Pittsburgh and graduate for, I went to the last two years of high school in Pittsburgh. Um, so we have that, we don't call it that. Um, I think it is, uh, it is more or less successful. Um, there are places in the law where there aren't a lot of black folks it really starts to have um, some issues when you get to the partnership level. Um, and we can talk about that. I think one of the questions, you know, the difficulty with becoming a partner if you're African American or of color is it is harder to get in the way of uh, flows of business. Um, it's just a little bit more difficult. Um, but I think that we also leaven it and so because we have, a, we, we have requisitions for various positions. This is outside the partnership. But if you're African American or, or a person of color, we, we will tend to try and hire even if it's not against an exact requisition, which takes pressure off of when you get a slate. It takes pressure off of trying to get a slate of diverse candidates. It takes pressure off of those people who are, say that they're in favor of diversity but really there's a little friction in that in their decision making process. And so maybe they didn't look as hard as they could. So we put, in my mind, I don't think my firm would say it this way, but it, I, I think about it. We put pressure on that, the Rooney rule, but we also really can step outside that 
and do it outside of that process. Um, so I want to go back to the time piece. So like in at my company, a lot of the conversation is the amount of time it takes to hire folks of color. Um, and you know, what, what are the ways in which, how do you combat that? Like that sometimes it does take a little bit longer. Is that, a, is that something that companies should be considering up front is how you know how do you lay that out for folks who are like we have a product deadline in a few months and if we don't meet this deadline then you know essentially we're losing money how do you how do you how do you uh, share that or like give way to to folks who have to convince, make that uh, make that argument for their executive team I think it's it has to be systematic right like you you should never be in that position first of all. So, you know, when uh, workforce planning is happening and, you know, headcount is coming up and budgets are coming up, you know, we, we understand that things change, but in my opinion, if you're rushing to hiring someone, you're contradicting when you're saying you wanna hire the absolute best. Because if you're trying to make the best meal of your life, you're not gonna try to make it in 30 minutes. You see what I'm saying? So. It's, it's one of those things where you just can never allow yourself to get into that position. Now, I know it happens, right? So in addition to the, the, the Rooney Rule is called a rule for a reason, right? And again, you have to have processes in place in order to ensure that when that slate is in front, people know how to handle it that way. You are best friends with that talent acquisition team so that you're not rushing to hire, that you are presenting a diverse slate of candidates, and you're not saying, hey, here's your diverse slate of candidates. You're not leading like that, right? So I think all the questions you're asking, there's, there's a sequence that takes place, right? However, um, like I said, things change. So when you are in a position where you have to, to really um, hire quickly, that's when you call on your contacts and your connectors and you're not like, I went to this school, I know they got some people, you know, so just be a huge influencer on that. But who are the influencers that you need to engage and that's your talent acquisition team. Yeah. I, you're absolutely right. And one thing that you, I think sometimes you have to do while you're in those spaces when people are trying to push and hire quickly is you sometimes have to be the broken record to say, what are we really here for? Are we trying to get the best talent? Like it, it feels a little, um, you feel like you're speaking out of turn sometimes, but you, somebody has to put the buck and say, if, if we're just gonna hire another mediocre person, <laughs> then you know, you're know you not bringing, you're bringing someone else in quick, let's bring in somebody that's diverse. I mean, that's how I feel about it. We're bring, it's a full slate of people in, bring them in. But I do think that oftentimes you do have to say, we're not going about this the right way. We're kind of, we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot if we don't look at this correctly. Oftentimes, because of the time pressure, because of senior executives, because of just the business needs, everybody will sort of just whitelist something and say, no pun intended, but just say, okay, okay, let it go because of the time pressure. But you can't, you have, someone has to stand up in that moment and be able to say, we can't do this. If we really want what it is that we say we want here, we have to, um, we have to stand by our, our, our um, values and what we're actually setting out to do. Yeah.